Today's lecture will focus on engineering for expression in bacteria. The reason why researchers have given a lot of importance to E. coli is because it is a workhorse of the biotech industry. So in the biotech industry, we need to produce a large number of enzymes and therapeutic proteins in hosts. So for the purpose of expression of proteins which are routinely used like enzymes, you have to use E. coli. It's cheap, it's easy to replicate and it's easy to recover the proteins from E. coli. In the case of therapeutic proteins, the E. coli of the eukaryotic world is Chinese hamster ovary CHO cell lines. CHO cell lines can express therapeutic proteins and you can recover therapeutic proteins from CHO cell lines as well. However, the cost of CHO cell lines and maintaining them cell lines is very expensive. Oh. So, which is why we refer to go back to bacteria. So, a majority of the industrial proteins such as enzymes are expressed in E. coli. So, E. coli is amenable to scale up. You can scale up production of E. coli in a bioreactor. Okay. That's the advantage. You have a flask culture in the lab. Your flask culture is like less than a liter. So, in general expression systems, E. coli produces around 20 to 200 milligram per liter of protein, okay. per liter of uh, culture. So, you get 200 milligrams of protein per liter of per medium. medium. Okay. So, if, if you want to scale up, you have to resort to a bioreactor. But not all proteins can be scaled up, some cannot. This is a case study which is generally given to our students. You have a job in which your manager asks you to express enzymes using E. coli. So how do you proceed? We generally ask the students to think about this. Like, how will you proceed? What techniques will you use? Which legal issues need to be considered? Will it work? Now you have to understand that when we express E. coli, uh, we express proteins in E. coli, we use what is known as a generally regarded as safe host or the grass host, which is the BL21 strain. This strain cannot survive outside the lab. It has oh. requires the medium, which is the lysogeny broth or LP medium. Okay. So if by chance there's a spill, a biological spill, and it escapes into the environment, what we term as a breach of containment, uh -huh. the bacterial host will not survive in the conventional or the ambient environment. It will die out because of lack of media. The objectives of the lecture are to understand the principle of recombinant protein expression in E. coli, which I have explained to you earlier in our discussion. To understand the workflow involved in gene construction, which we will discuss during the course of this lecture, and to identify and resolve problems associated with recombinant protein expression in E. coli that involves troubleshooting. So, if you have worked with E. coli, you have probably worked with top 10. Top 10 is used for the cloning of vectors which contain gene inserts, for instance, construction of libraries. For protein expression, we use other hosts such as BL21 and DH5-alpha, which are used. So these are some hosts. But before you begin expression or design of your experiment, you should ensure that your vector and host are compatible, which brings us down to the plasmids and the promoter. So BL21 requires a T7 promoter binding site in order for it to be compatible with that host strain. We also have the origin of replication, then the marker genes, which is generally an antibiotic resistance marker. And you then have to think about your expression host and your affinity chromatography system. Once you express your protein, the next st stage is purifying it mm -hmm. and recovering it oh. and refolding it and rendering it biologically active. This is because if you have a protein which is expressed and which is not biologically active, there's no point in expressing it. Yeah. It's, it's basically just a protein amino acid sequence. So that rendering it biologically active is a key constituent of this process. In the case of antigens, mm -hmm. which are 
uh, derived from bacterial hosts or from virus, viral code proteins, there is no need for rendering them biologically active. Because if you linearize them, you can utilize them for ELISA or other diagnostic oh. approaches. There is no question of uh, engineering them for native for their native state. These are your outputs. So you should be able to describe the workflow involved in the recombinant protein expression in E. coli and identify and resolve problems which may be associated with protein expression in E. coli. The things which can go wrong. Although we designed this experiment mm -hmm. with E. coli, we ensure we have an intact open reading frame, we ensure that we have the correct promoter, the mismatch between host and vector is resolved, we can still end up in pro uh, situations where there will be no expression of protein. Okay, this may be due to host factors Th and because your protein of interest is not native to that specific host. For instance, if you give E. coli a large protein like keratin, mm -hmm. to a, it, may, it may not express it because it's too large, there will be macromolecular crowding. And at the last stage, you should be able to develop an experimental protocol for the cloning and expression of specific genes. Okay, so some of the key concepts you have to be aware of are protein translation, chaperone, signal peptides, and codon optimization. So protein translation, you are all aware of. You read it during your undergraduate. Chaperones are specific proteins in E. coli, which will facilitate the folding of proteins. Okay. So E. coli has these chaperones and they are also termed as heat shock proteins because their activity is induced by heat. They were discovered as heat shock proteins. So you have your organism which is growing at a certain temperature, for instance 25 degrees and then you subject it to higher temperatures, for instance okay. 35 degrees. The, the organism will try to contain the damage caused by the excessive heat by refolding the proteins in a different format. Because uh -huh. proteins are physical molecules. If you increase the temperature, their conformation will change. So E. coli has a protective mechanism. When the temperature is increased to a certain level, for instance, you increase it to 42, they will start producing chaperonins in a large... Uh, they will express chaperonins. And this chaperone proteins will bind to your proteins and they will refold them into the correct conformation. So when we express, overexpress our genes of interest in E. coli, the chaperones cannot handle that high level oh, of yeah, expression. Okay. So we need to refold outside the host. However, in some cases when you do a level of expression which is just below the threshold of macromolecular crowding, E. coli will express the proteins as uh, in their native form. So in this case you need to utilize strains of E. coli such as BL21, we have origami, Okay, origami has a DSP isomerase which will facilitate folding of protein. And the last thing is codon optimization. Codons need to be optimized. Now, in the area of synthetic biology, it's very easy to optimize codons. We don't isolate genes anymore, we synthesize them. We okay. insert them into vectors. Signal peptides are elements of the protein. They are like 20 to 30 amino acids, usually at the amino terminal end, which will direct the protein to a specific tissue in the host. For instance, signal peptide. Some of the proteins in our body are produced in one organ and secreted in another organ. And the way they transfer from one organ to another, to our circulatory system, is via signal peptides. So when you express a human growth factor, for instance, in E. coli, mm -hmm. there's no need of the signal peptide. It can be truncated. So this is another case study which pertains to antigenic vaccine production. So you can refer to that during your reading of this lecture. So the first concept which you have to understand is the ribosome. Okay? The ribosome is the machinery which is involved in the translation of the protein. So just to recap. Your ribosomal protein is actually a complex of the RNA which is folded as well as small proteins. It will look something like this. This is the diagram and it's involved in the basically in the translation of your RNA into protein. 
Okay, so you have the different kinds of ribosomal subunits in prokaryotes and eukaryotes. The second aspect is the chaperones, uh, which are basically proteins which facilitate the folding of other proteins. So this is a basic description of the model. So when you have a protein which is basically translated, certain chaperones will bind to the protein and they will facilitate folding by attraction or drawing of the different amino acid chains together. Okay, so these are some of the chaperones. The reason why we show this slide to you is because when you buy your strain, for instance you choose your E. coli strain from a catalog, you should ensure that you have the right protein in that host, the right chaperone. For instance, if you want to prevent protein aggregation, you have DNA J. Okay. Alternatively, the alternative metal, uh, method to prevent protein aggregation is you basically reduce the level of expression by giving it lower concentration of IPTG or culturing the cell at lower temperature. E. coli has an optimum at 37, you can express protein at 15 degrees. 15. Yeah, 15. So when you reduce the temperature, the chance of aggregate formation and misfolding gets reduced. However, the, at the cost of protein yield. Uh, so you, yeah, the yield will be lower because you are using uh, a lower temperature. However, the chance of aggregation, the uh, likelihood is reduced. Okay, so this is the conceptual diagram of refolding. So it's basically a model. This is not how it looks in the real protein format. It's just a concept in which you have, a, for example, like a cylinder and the protein is threaded to it like a needle. Uh -huh. It comes out on the other side in the refolded format. Wow. Okay. That's a conceptual framework. It's a hypothetical model. Of course, they have documentary evidence to prove these structures in terms of the crystallography. Okay. So once a protein is produced, it translated in our system, in a eukaryotic system or in a bacterial system, it is it has to be targeted to a specific tissue. Okay. Okay. The way it's targeted to a specific tissue is via signal peptides. These signal peptides are generally located at the amino terminal end of the protein. So the protein will, for instance, a protein produced in your liver, mm -hmm. which needs to be transported to your, for instance, to your kidney, will have an associated signal peptide. So it will pass through your circulatory system and the signal peptide will direct it towards the kidney. target tissue and then it will be cleaved because the, the purpose of the signal peptide is only to direct the protein from one mm. tissue to another. Now if you express a recombinant protein from a eukaryotic host in E. coli, you don't have to direct it anywhere unless you are producing specific protein which are signal peptide cleaved protein. For instance, if you are producing an enzyme in E. coli. You don't have the enzyme, you need a pure form of the enzyme, you don't need the signal peptide. Okay. So you just truncate the signal peptide and you express the main body of the protein. So these can be predicted using specific software. Okay, so this is the signal peptide which is usually located at amino terminal and it's usually around 20 to 30 amino acids in length. So when you have secretion, the protein is expressed in the cell and secreted out using a specific pathway. Now you can uh, exploit this process by targeting the E. coli expressed protein with a fusion tag which will enable the E. coli to secrete it out of the system. For example, you want the protein to be secreted by E. coli in the medium. You don't want E. coli to retain it in their cytosol. So all you need to do is put in a tag like a flagellin tag flagella uh, at the periphery of the bacterium. So okay. if you attach a flagellin tag, the E. coli will assume that it's flagella protein and secrete it out. Oh. Or even if you have pilin, pili are uh, the uh, proteins which uh, are secreted as well uh, from proteins uh, yeah, because they have the pilus. So. so the advantage of gram-negative bacteria is that you can recover proteins in the the space between the membranes. Okay. So in the case of gram-positive bacteria, the protein has no place to basically be uh, repositioned. So in the case of gram-negative bacteria, you can basically direct the protein to the periplasmic space. Uh -huh. Okay, That's a periplasmic space. Now 
You will ask me why do we need to direct the protein to periplasmic space? Why not secrete it into the medium? Mm -hmm. Okay. Imagine the situation. E. coli is producing the protein. It's secreted from the E. coli into the medium. However, in a one liter, for instance, you have one liter of culture. Your protein will be all over the culture medium. Okay. And you will also have enzymes like proteases in the culture medium, which will degrade the protein. Uh-huh. And when you recover, want to recover the protein, you have to filter one liter of medium. Oh. Okay. So your likelihood of recovering the protein is lower, and your and your cost is very high. So in most experiments involving uh, E. coli, the protein will be directed to the periplasmic space. So after you recover your cell pellet, you can lyse the E. coli and recover the protein. How we make sure the the periplasmic space? Yeah. How yeah okay. You, so it you. applies the same principle of secretory tags applies. You fuse your protein to what is known as a periplasmic localization signal or a PEL tag. Okay, so when you have your multiple cloning site, like PET vectors, they come with a PEL tag. So they will few, they will express the protein and direct it to the periplasmic space. Okay, oh. so you can refer to that periplasmic space. So it's the membrane bound space. So when you recover your protein, it will come bound to the membrane. It's easier to recover. Okay, so you can see the concept. You have your membrane which is bound to the proteins and then you recover your membrane mechanism. Doctor, can I have a break five minutes? Yeah, yeah sure.